So this is the road to war for our Battletech Alpha Strike campaign. This is just an introduction to the campaign to help the audience understand what's happening behind the curtains that led to the battle reports on YouTube. These rules are not perfect. We made changes along the way when we felt something wasn't working. The key thing is for everyone to have fun because in the end, one side will lose and the winning side only gets rewarded with bragging rights and nothing else. First of all, the campaign rules were made in-house, based on campaign rule set I developed for a medieval fantasy war game. The original rules are called the Gambit Signum, which you can pick up off the website thegamecrafter.com, links in the description below. However, for Battletech, we made some changes, and you can pick up a PDF of the campaign guide that we're using for this campaign off of our Patreon site. So without further ado, let's get into it. First off, the strategic map. The strategic map is a web of navigation points called routes and locations. This is key to how a map is made using these campaign rules. You always have a route that connects to a location, which in turn connects to another route. When a unit moves, let's say it can move three navigation points, it would move from this route to this location, then from that location to the next route, then finally to the next location. Above is a schematic view of the game mechanic, and below is what it would look like on a map. There are unique routes and locations, but we'll get back to that in a moment. The key thing to remember is that a map is a web of routes that connects locations. Since one movement of navigation point can traverse an entire route, you wouldn't want to make one long route. For example, you want to have a long, lonely road going through the desert. To signify how long and desolate the road is, you could have several routes that connect to locations, specifically to locations called junctions, which is a location that links two routes and nothing else is going on there. So in a nutshell, you cannot have two routes connected to one another because that would just be one route and one route must connect to one location. However, there are locations that can be immediately adjacent to one another without any routes connecting those locations. These are urbanized zones like cities. Those locations are called districts. In this example, our unit could enter the town of Westyard, which is a location. Then the unit can move along a route into Putergate, which is a location district in the city of Port Jasper. Once the unit is in Putregate, the unit can move freely from that district to any adjacent districts because the unit is now inside the city of Port Jasper. So I mentioned earlier there are unique routes. In our campaign, you will see some dashed lines. Those represent unique routes which can only be traversed by air units like VTOLs, or artillery can fire over those routes for ranged attacks and support. We also have water crossing routes which takes a special action to traverse, but more on that in just a bit. As for locations, I already mentioned towns and districts. There are actually several more, including modifiers for those locations. For example, logistics hubs and ports add to the location's abilities, making them tactical targets or allow them to give benefits to those who control them. Logistics hubs seem to have preoccupied the minds of my players during Phase 1. There were times when a player withdrew from a battle, simply because they didn't want to risk sustaining too much damage without much to gain for it. The reason for this is because they didn't have a very good supply line. The battle was taking place far from friendly controlled logistics hubs, which meant it would be very costly to try to field repair those mechs, so they decided it wasn't worth the risk and withdrew from the battle. I'll get into more about repairs in a second, trust me, just, just hang in there. Okay, that's the gist of making a strategic map, and it's easy to make your own. We use Wonder Draft, which is software that you can use to make all kinds of maps. Or you just need some paper, pens, pencils, crayons, whatever. Just draw some lines and connect various points. And voila, you created your own web strategic map. Once you created a web of routes and locations, you can add in additional modifiers like logistics hubs to add some tactical nuance to the game. However, if you want to use the Blue Holes campaign map, it's on our Patreon page for download. Okay, so let's talk about phases and strategic turns, the bread and butter of the strategic game, which is where all the magic is happening. So a phase of a game is just segments of the battle that represents a length of real time for players. Decisions a player makes, such as the composition of the army, cannot be changed mid-phase. Whatever you have chosen for that phase, that's it. You're going to have to make do with what you got. This represents the difficulty it is for national powers to resupply an army fielded in battle. It creates scarcity for players, which creates opportunity, doubt, and tough choices, which is a great recipe for a strategic game. Now each phase is broken into strategic turns. In our campaign, the first phase had 14 strategic turns, which ended up giving us five major battles. Strategic turns helps us poor little game masters control the chaos and again create scarcity for the players, which in turn creates hard choices. 
All right, so let's talk about these strategic turns. Each strategic turn, players have four free actions. If they wish to make more actions, well, this is taxing on their limited military leadership capabilities, so it will cost them more in war chest points to buy another batch of four actions. And the player can do this up to a grand total of 16 actions per strategic turn. So what are these actions I mentioned? Well, the first one's maneuver. You can tell your army group to move around. When a unit is bunched together, we call them formations, and the entire unit moves as fast as the slowest member. Next up is force march. You get too close to the enemy, well, you just can't maneuver into them. You have to deliberately move to make your attack using the force march action. Force march is also how you command units to move across unimproved roads or take the goat trail to get to the rear of the Spartans. But in this campaign, we don't have any unimproved routes. Next up is withdrawal. If your unit is occupying the same space as an enemy unit at the end of the strategic turn, not when they first bump into each other, but at the end of the strategic turn when players do not have any actions left, they will commence battle. However, if the player still has actions left and wants to avoid battle, they can use this action of withdrawal and leave the navigation point occupied by the enemy. Little side note here. When players bump into each other, it quickly becomes a dog pile of units as more and more reinforcements are rushed into the battle. This is where I put up an artificial barrier for my players. Are you familiar with Moss Mouse? There are many acronyms for this bad boy, but this is the one I use to commit it to memory. These are the nine principles of war. Maneuver, offensive, simplicity, surprise, mass, objective, unity of command, security, and economy of force. And I am totally guilty of forcing my players to violate mass and economy of force. This is really for logistics purposes though. We just don't have enough time, nor the miniatures, to field huge armies. So right now, I limit my players to about two companies for intersphere armies and two binaries for clan armies. Things will likely change. I mean, I can't wait for the mercenary Kickstarter to arrive, am I right? So Game Masters, keep this in mind. To help make sure you got enough miniatures for your players, don't feel bad if you have to put a constraint on the size of combat forces, as long as the constraint is fairly implemented. Okay, back to strategic actions. Water crossing is to use this specific route of water crossing. It's expensive, but if you can afford it, go for it. Next is ship load and depart and ship land and unload. Basically, this is units getting on and off a dropship. In my campaign, even when the players didn't have intelligence assets to observe the action of dropships loading mechs, I told them an enemy dropship has entered orbit. So this is why you'll see both sides constantly launching dropships to move units. I mean, for one, it's faster and cheaper in terms of number of actions needed to move a unit over great distances, and two, it makes the other side a little nervous when they're informed an enemy dropship has entered orbit. Repairing a unit is not cheap nor easy. The repair action can be taken anywhere, but it is influenced by where you take the action. You want to get the best bang for your buck. This is why players prefer to be near logistics hubs or starports, because they can repair more with one action than they could with one action of doing field repairs. This also made my players hesitant to keep on fighting when their supply lines were getting too long because they were concerned they couldn't repair their units. The last action is diplomacy, which is part of our victory conditions, which is completely optional. Actually, I mean, all these rules are optional, but you, you get my point. So my players wanted a game where the objective is not simply to just destroy the other's army. They like to think of their armies as a means to get to their ends, which is to be politically supported and recognized ruler of the planet of Blue Hole. The factions that the players represent, at least at first, are trying to avoid an all-out war and instead want to pressure the other side into a peace agreement. If you're interested in how we do that, take a look at the guide, because it can be a bit tricky to explain and I don't think I can do it justice here. The guide also includes a culmination of our house rules and some more details and examples of how things work. Also there is a bit about how intelligence works, which I highly caution game masters to adopt, because it can slow turns down. There's also a bit of fluff explaining why each side is trying to do battle and conquer the planet of Blue Hole. Okay, last part. Here's a list of how we broke down our units to be used on the strategic map. Have a look at them while I close this video out. So that's the rules in a nutshell. As the game master, I generally give my players about a week in real time to make up their minds about what actions they want to take. Then we get on Discord and our VTT of choice and each side goes one turn at a time telling me what they're going to do. I update it on VTT for them so they can see on the map and if one side can see or observe the enemy, then I tell them and they take their actions and yada yada yada. You get the picture. This can take up some time because, like I said, the players wanted to have fog of war and thus limited information, which is a huge headache for the game master. So, you know, you do you, boo. Alright, so that's how we run our campaigns. If you want to use these rules or modify them for your own, more power to you. 
And just remember, never let the rules get in the way of having fun. Good luck, have fun, happy wargaming.